I'm Michael Engler. I directed the Downton Abbey film. I also worked on the series. I directed four episodes, including the series finale. With the opening sequence, it was really important for us to do a couple of things. One is we wanted to welcome back the audience, but also give them time to really get reacquainted with the world, remember what it was they loved about it, the richness, the detail, the scale of it, but also to set up a different kind of expectation so that on the one hand, while it would feel familiar, uh, the world, it would also feel heightened and uh, elevated in a lot of ways that would make you feel like it was worth coming out to the movies for and that it was going to be different than just what you had gotten at home, that there would be something special about it. In a lot of ways, this opening sequence really harkens back to the very first episode from the series when Bates arrives at the house is the beginning of it. And so it Bates and the telegram both arriving from from a distant place to bring us into the world and then specifically to Downton Abbey. So this did a similar kind of thing, which is setting up Stephen Campbell Moore's character here as a mysterious character who's, we don't know why he's going, where he's going. And then this letter from the palace and following it through the English countryside so that then eventually when we arrive at Downton, we're reintroduced to the village and to the house and everything. It would feel like the audience, the fans traveling back together to come back to this house that we've missed for a few years. We shot this all over the UK. This particular scene, the, well, the whole train sequence was shot up north in Yorkshire, and we shot a lot of it there. This is for the original village of Downton. It's a place called Bampton, a beautiful place about an hour and a half outside of London that's still pretty pristine. There's not that many things you have to cover to make it look like it's correct from the period. A few antennas and wires here and there, but mostly it's, uh, it's pretty intact. It was really important for me this first moment. What's the first image when you would see the house again? Because it's so iconic and it's so much a part of what the series was, that house. It's so unique. And now really anywhere you are in the world, anybody sees that picture and they say Downton Abbey. So I wanted both the feeling of that recognition of the homecoming to be exciting and emotional. And when we spoke with John Lunn about the score and scoring this section, I said, I think we should hold back on the big famous Downton theme until the very first shot of the house. So it really feels like we're getting to all of that at once. So bringing us around, bringing us to the back door of the house, and then slowly again through the house from the outside to the inside and then all through the house as we're sort of being reintroduced to our cast of characters. Here's our downstairs people, remembering that now in Carson's office, it's now Thomas who's running things because at the end of the series, he took over as Carson was aging and ready to retire. There were so many titles to get on the opening sequence. At first we thought maybe we should just save it for the end, it would be too long, but then we realized it was worth spending the time going through the house, taking the time for the arrival and all that, that it would be kind of a wonderful thing for the audience to relish. Just arrived, my lord. There's one from Buckingham Palace. Heaven. But we really need to cut back until the farms repay the investment, and we must make a plan for the roof. I also wanted it to feel like everything kept moving, moving, moving at the beginning, every shot until he says the king and queen are coming to say, and then suddenly everything stops on a dime, and uh, we realize this is the story we're going to be dealing with. This is why we've come here. here. There's to be a parade of the Yorkshire Hussars in the village. Is there any chance Henry might be back? Well, I doubt it. I'll send a telegram, but there's a motor show in Chicago that I know he cannot chuck. Tom... I think one of the trickiest things about the script, and I think what Julian's done so masterfully, is there are so many characters 
in Downton that the audience recognizes and so many stories that had developed over the years, trying to find a way to set up a story that felt like it had its own drive and arc to it, but at the same time would be able to catch you up and remind you who was who and where they were when we last saw them and give a sense of how things might have moved on in the household, upstairs and downstairs. And I don't like kings either. I suppose that makes me a Republican too. Are the English allowed to be? This is such a beautiful location in the north, a place called Alnwick. A-L-Y-N-W-I-C-K. It's the strangest spelling for that pronunciation. But anyway, a beautiful castle up in the north that we went in. And uh, everybody, when we were shooting in the, in the summer, and particularly in the fall, and we were shooting a lot in the north, and everybody said, oh, it's, the weather's going to be terrible. And we had the most glorious weather for our shoot, for all our exteriors, that even some people, some English people, when they saw the film the first time, uh, who were working with us, they asked us where we shot it. They said, did you shoot this in Czechoslovakia? Where did you shoot this? Because it was so sunny all the time, they couldn't believe it was in England. Can bring back as many vegetables as we could eat. Oh, yeah, I like to keep busy. How have they taken the news up at the house? Daisy singing the Marseillaise, so no surprises there. Oh, what's the matter? I thought it's a funny thing in this scene. He talks about them having been some of the greatest houses in the land, and I think, especially to most Americans, you see that house and you think of it as so extraordinary and the scale of it is so magnificent. But the truth is, it's actually quite a modest property considering some of the ones that are there, like the ones he mentions, Blenheim and Chatsworth and Arundel, that are huge, really, really enormous in scale, and that in some ways in the world of this show, this is actually quite a modest property, and I think it was kind of important for him to remind the audience of that. And here we are again with Stephen Campbell Moore's character, who we're trying to, again, sort of understand that this guy has come here and set up a, a little bit of a mystery because he's somebody new and we want to know, but we don't, need to, we don't want to know too much. The Lady Bagshaw, Your Majesty. Good. We'll go to the 1844 room as soon as they're here. Do sit down. I just received the plan for the tour of Yorkshire, ma'am. Yes, it's just been finalised. I think we'll enjoy it. I didn't realise we would be staying at Downton Abbey. Only for a night. There's to be a parade and a dinner. Here we're introducing a new character in the family who's played by Imelda Staunton. The character's Maud Bagshaw, and she's a distant cousin. And the idea was that as part of the film, we would even understand, right, of course, we've always gotten to know the family, the immediate family, but that it must extend out and that that was a way of continuing the story as we know it, but also expanding it out rather than starting with a completely new world of people. Exactly, ma'am. Well, surely they need to know if their hopes are to be disappointed. I wish I knew if they like simple food or fancy. I can't think they'll want simple food with that sort. Though they like sauces and everything volute and fresh. The downstairs scenes are always really fun to shoot because there's a, just a lot of flow of activity upstairs and in the sort of the world of the, the royalty and the, and the um, titled family and all that. You know, they tend to be more static, actually, when they're inside. They're sitting at a table. They're being served tea or something like that. Whereas downstairs, everybody's always moving around. So staging with the camera and the actors is always really fun. It's more of a of a ballet, of a dance, than just, you know, setting up the characters where they're going to be and then kind of moving the camera around to shoot them. I've not offended you, have I? Why do you say that? Well, for a start, you never talk about the wedding anymore. We'll get wed when we're good and ready and not before. But you see, I am ready. Take those up before we collapse. Maud Bagshaw is coming to Downton. Yes, as the Queen's lady-in-waiting. Oh, my goodness. Why so surprised? Who is she? Everybody was so thrilled that Maggie was back on screen and behind the scenes and fans, and that was always the first question everybody asked was, is Maggie back? Is Maggie back? And um, it was exciting to be there again with her and to have her be part of it. She, she's just such an extraordinary person. They all are really great actors, and they all appreciate each other very, very much. And they get along, and they... 
you know, take it very seriously and very professionally. But I think there was a sense with everybody being back and the fact that everybody did come back, including Maggie, made it feel in some ways really like a family reunion. And people having been away from it for a few years and having everybody in the world, wherever they went, to always ask about Downton, I think made them realize how much it meant to people out in the world. And I think it made coming back to do it again more meaningful as well as just a fun thing to be back with people who they enjoyed working with. From the family. Do you know the reason? Maybe. See, I believe she means to cheat your father of his rightful inheritance. She has no children. Your father is her nearest relation. I won't have her put on the spot. You're plotting something. I see a Machiavellian look in your eye. Machiavelli is frequently underrated. He had many qualities. So did Caligula, not all of them charming. What are you up to, Granny? I think one of the things that people always love most about the show, too, is the, the banter back and forth, the tension and, and sort of wit between Maggie's character and Penelope Wilton's character, Isabel. So again, this is a whole scene about reminding us how much it means to everybody in the world, but also who the characters are downstairs and how they all fit together. There was to be a royal visit. Well, now I know who not to trust with a secret. <laughs> that we should deserve such honour. Not you two. I am disappointed. Ignore her. I wonder, do you think I might be allowed to slip on my livery again? Well, would the school let you? Oh, they'll give me time for this, I promise. Yeah, let's wait till we know our orders. What about it, Mr Barrow? Will you let me wait upon my king and queen? Uh, well, that's us. Good night, Mr Mulsby. Uh, and we're done. Shall I fetch Johnny or will you? I can fetch him. Again, it was really important, I think, to let people know that, you know, in those days, you know, it, it would be very unlikely that anybody, especially any of these servants, their whole lives would have actually seen the king or queen in person, much less been able to serve them, wait on them, be, really be in their presence, have them stay at the house. And so it's a real point of excitement to be part of something like this. It, you know, it's before television they might have heard you know the king's voice on the radio but that would be it so to actually see them and then to have the honor of representing the house and serving them and getting a sense of them and being able to gossip and tell stories about what they looked like and what they seemed like would have been extremely exciting and meaningful for them can i have your attention please at four this afternoon, their majesty's butler, Mr. Wilson, will be coming over from Raby Castle with a lady's maid and a valet. To give us our instructions. With the royal servants, are we to wait on them? That is what will be made clear. I won't be waiting on any valets and ladies' maids, thank you very much. Before we get hot under the collar, let's just wait and see what they have to say. Amen. <laughs> This is a little town up in the north. It's actually part of a museum. It's the Museum of Yorkshire. The whole street is. The whole area of this property is. And it was a man's collection, a 19th century man who, late 19th, early 20th, who saw all these beautiful buildings being torn down in Yorkshire, where he was from, and wanted to protect them. And so he gathered all these buildings before they were torn down and bought them and then had them moved onto the site. And it eventually became... The whole site is like a living museum, and so we were able to use it and shut it down and make it feel like a street in York with the cable cars and everything. The, uh, the papers tell me the king and queen will be staying at Downton Abbey during their tour of Yorkshire. Well, if it's in the papers, it must be true. Yes, great honor. I think a lot of Americans don't naturally realize the story of the tension that was going on then, but really... In Ireland at the time, there was a real independence movement and the struggle for that was one such that, that one would have naturally been worried about the king's safety. And so it wouldn't be unusual that since they knew of Tom's background and him, them coming to the house that they would have checked up on him. Ah, oh, Barrow, they said you'd be in here. Heavens, we can still put on quite a show when we need to, I'm glad to see. Has it all been cleaned? More or less everything's been done to a basic level, milady. but we haven't done the final buffing up. Why not? I was waiting for the Majesty's butler. I thought I'd ask his advice on what to use on the table. Really? Can't we decide what we lay on our own dining table? 
Front doorbell, Mr. Barry. Please, go. Lady. Greetings, Mr. Wilson. Welcome to Downton Abbey. Uh, this way, Mr. Wilson. The royal butler's terribly scary. Barrow looked like a rabbit in front of a cobra. Oh, dear. Should I go down? They know what they're doing. Do they? They're hideously behind. There's a mark on the blue room carpet we can't shift. I have no chairs for the parade, and we haven't even decided on the footman. I'm going to have another cup if no one's coming up to serve. This is nice. Princess Mary wants us for tea tomorrow at Harwood. Oh, I've got so much to do. I wonder if that means the young couple have taken over the big house. Well, they're hardly the young couple. Well, he isn't anyway. She always seems quite... So, again, we have a lot of characters to introduce who are new to the film, so the princess is one of them, and how she ties into the story of the royal visit. ...and come back to Downton in advance of their majesties on Thursday. So this is where we also start to understand that the, the royal visit isn't just the royalty that are coming, it's also the whole royal staff, and the way the, the downstairs, which is the staff, is undermined and put into chaos by the visit because of the way things are run when there is a royal visit. Well, what should I order? Nothing. He will bring it all. And we don't cook any of the food? Um, cook for the servants. Monsieur Corbet won't have time for that. Oh, I say, that is something to look forward to. Calm yourself, Mrs. Patmore, if it's the way these things are done. Mrs. Webb and four footmen will arrive with Monsieur Corbet the day before. Who is this Mrs. Webb, is it? She is the housekeeper. She will also bring two maids. So this is where we set up that suddenly the, this opportunity for them to really shine and to really show their loyalty and their pride is being completely stripped away from them, that the rug is being pulled out from under and basically the royal staff is going to be taken over while they're there. And excuse me, I am not a butler. I am the king's page of the back stairs. <laughs> so our staff has nothing to do. One of the interesting things about directing Downton, and I think for the actors, is that the tone of it can have such range. On the one hand, the drama can be very emotional and heartfelt. The stakes can be very high. But at the same time, it really often plays as a comedy. A lot of it is comic. So this story here is one that plays as sort of the main comic through line of the film, which is what's going on downstairs and then their plot to set things right. You can hardly heckle Lady Bagshaw in front of the Queen. Well, I'm just trying to prevent a crime. Who says it's a crime? I do. Oh, and you're an expert in the matter. I am an expert in every matter. You must have some idea why she doesn't want Robert as her heir. I have none. He is her closest relative. The family have held Brumpton for three centuries. Penelope and Maggie are, are good friends, and whenever they have these scenes, it's always a good time because... They laugh a lot together and they enjoy each other. And the fact that they can sort of bicker and play enemies, I think, is fun for them because they feel so safe with each other. Well, that's what I intend to find out. Again, it was important to obviously to have Carson play a, a strong part in the film because he was always such a strong presence in the series. So. Julian found a way to bring him back by feeling that somehow Thomas was maybe not quite up to this level, and he had been setting that up in the earlier scenes. Thingamy will choose which pieces to use. I see. The truth is, he's in a sort of trance. Won't you help me? I feel I'm pushing a rock uphill. I'll be there in the morning, my lady. Don't you worry. You're a treasure, Carson. That's all there is to say. I'll see myself out. You could never refuse her anything. And what about Mr. Barrow? Mr. Barrow can like it or lump it. Then I'm afraid he'll lump it. We have supper after the upstairs dinner, so you've plenty of time. Thanks. How does it work with two valets? Well, I prepare His Majesty's clothes and uniforms for Downton, and when Mr. Miller arrives, I get the stuff for Howard ready. 
Then I head back to London and prepare for their return. It all overlaps. So Mr Miller's the one who actually dresses the king? Unless he's ill. No, it's me. Is he often ill? No. <laughs> I think it's rubbish. They impose, they demand, and now we're to be made nothing in our own house. It's very disappointing, I won't deny it. Water's not too hot. Have they all been having baths? How should I know? Mr Barrow, don't you think you should speak? Again, here we're just starting to set up really the tension between, you know, the two household staffs and how it's going to affect everything. So many servants with them. Maybe it's because they go from house to house around the county and they need to know things are done the way they like. As if we couldn't manage that. We're not footballs, Mr. Bates, and we don't deserve a kick in. I felt it was really important too that this moment of Carson returning to the house felt for the audience and for him like an exciting, powerful moment. It means so much to him, and that's really where he had his sense of identity so so strongly etched was his being the butler of a great house. Oh, I see. So it's now. I've sent down for Mr. Barrow to join us, my lord. You wanted to see me, my lord. Mr. Carson, what brings you here? Well, this is the thing. Carson is going to move back into the house for the royal visit. What? You are coming back here as... I love the comedy of this scene. This was a scene... We actually... One of those things that happens on, on a set often where, you know, you're, you're working all day and then... Suddenly, you have to shoot a scene very, very quickly. And this was one of those that we had to shoot very, very fast because of the light and the timing and the schedule. And the actors just had such a good time with it and just jumped in very quickly and rose to the occasion. God, that's all we need. Now, Barrow. Not to worry. The plumber will soon have it mended, my lady. And we'll bring water jugs up to the bedrooms tonight and in the morning. It can't be that hard. We did it for 300 years. Thank you, Carson. Well, that went well. Will you sack him? No, as a matter of fact, I was quite interested. I never thought of him as a man of principle before. Oh. This was also shot in Beamish. I mean, we needed to have a part of the village. It needed to feel like part of the village that we hadn't seen before because we had never seen Mr. Bakewell's shop. And this is a beautiful period shop that already has all of these things in it. And we just had to sort of dress specifically for ours. This is Mark Addy, who people might remember from The Full Monty, who's a magnificent actor. He's actually from that area. So he has that beautiful Yorkshire accent. Um, and he's just the loveliest, loveliest guy. And I find this so funny. We always said, you know, this is a scene that from a story point of view, you don't need. But it says everything about the soul of this story, which is how meaningful it is for everybody here. And it does it in such a comic and, and touching way that we just knew we had to make it so good that, there, that nobody could make the case for cutting it. And I was really glad that it, it stayed. Everyone's so jealous. Oh, now, I've put ticks next to the ones I think you'll go for. Now, the thing is... I'm guessing the luncheon will be for around a dozen. Of course, the dinner will be larger. Let's say 30 or thereabouts. You'll correct me if I'm wrong. Well, you You're not wrong, Mr Bakewell. But we'll say if the numbers change. The pavlova's not realistic. We'd be safer with the Charlotte Ruse. We can do most of the work before. And I shall be serving you. Think of that. <laughs> I've danced with a man who's danced with a girl who's danced with the Prince of Wales. Man, I'm crazy with excitement. Completely off the rails. <laughs> All of my suppliers are... What's so funny is I think it's... Most people don't really see it coming, but that Mosley story, played by Kevin Doyle, is going to become one of the key stories in the film. And he's always played such a wonderful supporting role. He's had good stories. But that in the film, he his story really accidentally becomes an important story, and uh, he's such a wonderful actor. He can do the most subtle, dramatic, emotional things and the boldest comic things and always be completely real. I, I adore him. And he's the funniest man, too. No nanny, even. It's 1927. <laughs> We're modern folk. Nanny will take care of Marigold, and Anna can look after you. Really? Can she? Of course. Just like the old days, good. Granny's here and Isabel, and we're paying a call this afternoon on Princess Mary. Oh, has my new ball dress arrived? Not yet, but it will. Hello, Mary. How are you? 
How long have you worked for Her Majesty, Miss Lawton? Six years. Oh, interesting. I expect you're a skilled needlewoman for that job. Well, I've had no complaints. I trained under Madame Lucille. Her Majesty wanted a professional dressmaker. And they found you? My reputation found me. Again, it was sort of tricky figuring out exactly how to introduce all these characters so that as the story progresses, we have a sense of who they are and how, the, how they're going to play into the story. And um, I think he's done it so economically. Princess Mary. Well, she is royal. Royal women are not meant to grin like Cheshire cats. Well, they don't have to look miserable. Oh, to you, she looks miserable. To me, she looks dignified. Doesn't that say it all? How comforting to see you here, Carson. What prompted you to take up the flaming sword again? I felt I should go where I could do the most good, my lady. Wise words for all of us. This is a beautiful place. This is actually Harwood, the place that it is in the story, which is this beautiful house, royal house in... Yorkshire, and um, it's where Princess Mary at the time lived, and it's where they're visiting. We actually got to shoot there, which I don't think has been done before. And they were happy to have us. I think everybody's always happy to have the Downton people now because they know we'll do justice to it and we'll present it in a way that makes it look as good as it can, but also that we'll protect it and that we treat it with care and with love. Just don't paint anything. <laughs> They're sick of the smell of new paint. <laughs> I hope it's not too late. Are you living here now, ma'am? No, no, we're still at Goldsborough. But this Lord actress, Harvey Kate Phillips, I think is incredibly it. lovely. And, you know, I think one of the hardest things about this period and some of these characters for the actors is that so much of what they have to do that's correct to the period is actually not show or express their feelings or their emotions so that when they do, it's very specific and it's very dramatically appropriate. This is your lucky day. I'm the new plumber, Tony Selleck. Oh, yes, right. Well, I'd better show you where the boiler is. Where are you off to? This is Mr. Selleck, the plumber. I'm taking him to the boiler house. Well, do it. No, you are right. Just tell Mrs. Patmore where I am. Please bring the boys on Thursday. Oh, how lovely. Why are the children in here? Well, we just got This character, Lord Harwood, who was an actual character at the time, and he was apparently a very, very difficult man, but, you know, what was interesting about it in, in sort of doing the research was that he had really suffered post-traumatic stress from World War I, and um, everybody said he came back very sort of rigid and shaken and easily thrown and kind of irascible and, you know, with a flaring temper. So it was interesting. I mean, you never really get a chance to, in his story, get under his skin and find out anything about why he is who he is. But it's a, it's a fascinating thing, you know, when you do that kind of research. And he serves in the story really just to be a difficult person. But then the more you learn about it, the more you sort of understand that he comes by it honestly and in a painful way. Aren't you going to wish me luck? You don't look as if you need me to wish you luck, Mr. Selick, or anyone else for that matter. You don't know what I need. And I don't intend to find out. Also, the ideas of romance and flirtations is always a big part of, of Downton, too, so we wanted to make sure that those played well in all the different areas that we had them. Getting ready for their majesties, I see. That's right. This is Lord Hexham. May I present Major Chetwood? Are you here for the parade? I am. I'm staying at the pub. Hello, Lord. Excuse me. Or are you here to keep an eye on me? I was rather hoping you'd be my guardian. So here again, just continuing the idea that, you know, the security people around the king are keeping an eye on Tom Branson, and he's trying, you know, he's a loyal family member, but the fear that they all have that something could happen, and he's starting to feel the pressure of it now, and others in the family are starting to be aware that he's being tracked in that way. What about you, milady? The film was the first time we used drone shots like that previous one. During the series, they really wanted to keep it more a feeling, I think, of what they started with in the period that, you know, not to get too tricky technically so that you wouldn't 
notice it in in a modern technological way that it, how, of how it was being shot. But we sort of felt like with the film we could really pull out all the stops and give it a, a glamour and a scale that it hadn't had before. Well, how's the boiler? I'm sure they'll fix it soon. And here is where I was saying, you know, now the family is starting to worry. Not just are they investigating him or following him, but just would he do anything? And their suspicions, you know, start to be seeded or possibly seeded. You know, at this point, Mary has total faith in him, but it's interesting how that slowly starts to get undermined. Listen, lady, there's a little one here who still needs turning. Oh, careful. Mr. Selleck, you'll make Daisy blush. It's more than that to make me blush. Now get that down, yeah? You deserve that. It's very late. Well, I've got to get it done. And I don't mind long hours. I uh, mean to build my own business. And you can't do that working nine to five. These water jugs nearly killed me. How did we manage in the old days? Well, maybe people were tougher then. Maybe they expected less from life. Well, I expect a lot from life. So do I. And I mean to have it too. <laughs> you still here? Mr. Selleck's been working hard for hours for our benefit, Andy. Then it's time you went home. Is the savoury ready? Take this. Mm. He's right. The new pump should arrive around nine. I'll be here. So will we. Ta-ra. That was Mama. She's in London. She's staying with Rosamond. She can't be. She was here for lunch. She didn't say anything. She went up this afternoon. She'll be back tomorrow, so I've asked her to come for tea. You must persuade her to leave Maud Bagshaw alone. <laughs> I don't believe even Mama will pick a quarrel in front of the king. I wonder if he can come early. <laughs> Are you excited? I am a bit. Are you? Would it be common to admit it? Not to an American. This is wonderful, this scene. I mean, I think it's really important. He's always reminding you, Julian, of just that whatever people are going through, what their relationship is. And I think, again, that little reminder that she's American, he's British, it means a lot to both of them to have a moment like this, but in slightly different ways. But that they're a team, always. This was wonderful. We wanted to have a couple of these kinds of sequences where we would really understand about what it takes to run a house like this and to set up a visit like this, the scale of preparations that were in it, and then to really set up the arrival so that it would feel like like what it took to be up to the level that, that was required of them. I am Monsieur Courbet, and this is Mrs. Webb, the housekeeper. Ah. Follow that path, and it'll take you into the kitchen courtyard. I said I am Monsieur Courbet. Chef to the <laughs> What's funny, too, is we had on the set, we had a couple of people who had been in the royal household over the years, and um, they thought it was sort of funny the way the royal household was being depicted as very, you know, snotty and superior. And, and the people we had on the set were the loveliest, warmest most down-to-earth people, but they thought it was very, very funny that the royal servants were presented as snooty and, and difficult because really, in reality, while they have to come and keep the standards up when they're traveling with the king and queen, they make a point of trying to be part of the, the world that they're working in and, and to fold in, to weave in with the world that they're coming to be a part of. How did you manage it? A gardener helped me carry everything in so no one saw. I suppose you could sell the lot and use the money to pay Mr. Bakewell. Don't worry. They can eat it gradual when the visit's over. Ah, it's done, Mrs. Batmore. The new pump's installed. Hail the conquering hero. It's Mrs. Hughes you should be telling, or Mr. Carson, not them. All right, Mr. Selleck, we'll see the news gets through. Thanks. I don't need your help, Mrs. Hughes. I just want to know where their majesties are sleeping so Miss Stinson can prepare the rooms. Then I will show you, Mrs. Webb, because without my help, you will not find them. Is it always like this? A royal visit is like a swan on a lake, grace and serenity above. Demented kick. This is Max Brown. He's such a wonderful actor and also a lovely person. 
also from that area. It's interesting. I think because of his look, you know, he's very uh, elegant looking. And I think because of his look, he always tends to play more sort of upper crust people. He gets cast more often, but he's actually from Yorkshire and has that accent naturally. It's an interesting thing the way in the UK, accents say a lot more about people, I think, than they do here. It's more than just regionalism. It often has to do with class or upbringing or something. And so it's interesting the way they all are very, very particular about the kinds of accents they're doing and, and how exactly people are being portrayed in regard to that. Again, what's he playing at? Oh, I saw Tom looking very stern as I came up the drive. I hope he's not building a bomb. Many a true word is spoken in jest. We think he's being tailed by special branch. Nonsense. Mama, how was London? Oh, fine. Fine. What were you there for? Oh, various things. But do you hate London? Whoever told you that? Now, when do you want me tomorrow? Twelve at the latest. They arrive at half past. But, Mama, you must promise not to attack Maud Bagshaw. Well, I can't ignore her. She is my cousin. Exactly. Greet her as a cousin and leave it at that. You know, I'll think about it. But even if she has left everything to an outsider, what could we do? Challenge the will. On what basis? Undue influence. But how could you know that and how would you prove it? We'd find a friendly judge. Friendly or corrupt? Whichever does the trick. Are you here for dinner, Mama? It's a buffet. Well, I'm not changed. We won't change either, so you just need to take off your hat. You talk as if that were easy. <laughs> Where's the paper knife? The silver one with my regimental crest. So here we're setting up this, what is this question? Is there stuff missing? What's going on, you know? But then my food is only fit for servants. Well, at least your young hero seems to have sorted out the water. And setting up this tension a little more between Daisy and Andy. Oh, it was just a joke. But why is it funny? Oh, Andy, leave it. Again, I think it's so brilliant the way Julian has woven all of these stories into the greater story so that the tension between Daisy and, and Andy, you know, comes up, you know, within the story of the boiler and then it's made worse by the fact that their story is developing more conflict, which affects the whole royal visit, which is the central story of it. And, and that's really what's driving the whole thing. Please, I'm sure you'll find... Out of my way. I would have a bath, and then I will decide. Perhaps I will find a hotel. Where can we eat? Somewhere apart. Uh, why not in the servant hall? We never eat with the resident staff. The, the water's cold. What's happening? This is impossible. We can't stay here with no hot water. Are you crazy? But the boy... It was also important to us, as you see here, to, uh, even though Thomas is not part of the running of the household during this visit because he's been eliminated to keep him as part of the story in a strong way. So what's great is he ends up getting kind of his own story. He gets to sort of move on to a, a separate track, which is interesting and allows us to do some things that the show hadn't ever really done before. What do you want? Since you are in my room, sitting at my desk. This was a scene that came in later. We did it when we were doing some reshoots. We added the scene because we really felt like all of the sort of the main, you know, the two chefs, the two uh, housekeepers, you know, had had their direct conflicts. And we had never really had that with the two of them. And so the way it all develops and pays off, we felt the two of them needed a scene where David Haig's character of the royal butler took over from Carson and sort of humiliates him a little bit. It's well and truly damaged. Can you mend it in time? Oh, yeah. Well, somebody should tell them someone wanted to wreck the royal visit. They ought to know. Has the dress arrived? Not yet. What am I going to wear? Carson, what is it? Uh, some folding chairs. Well, a great many chairs have been delivered, my lady. They're at the back door. Anna thought you should be told at once. She's right. They're for the parade. And we'll have to set them out tonight. There'll be no time tomorrow. The villagers will start arriving from nine onwards. I'm not sure fate is on our side. Poor little Mary. Have we let her take on too much? Yes, you're right. Come on. We should lend her a hand. You can't go out in this. Of course we can. Good night, Mama. Remember to pray for us, mainly for better weather. Yeah, I'll put in a word. Of course, little Mary could hammer a tent peg with her teeth. I wonder who she got that from. You know, I'm always surprised when you praise me. I'm surprised to hear that I have. 
As if things aren't bad enough without a thunderstorm. We'll manage. I've roped in Mr. Molesley and Andy's gone for the truck, but, well, Mr. Bates can't help and Mr. Barrow's vanished. Ditto. Lord Hexham's out looking for Mr. Branson. We'll have to do our best without them. You're not going yourself. Well, how else will they know what to do? Then I'll fetch our cots. But you don't have to come. Of course I do. I'll just tell Mr. Bates where I've gone. You're a good friend to me, Anna. I hope we're good friends to each other, my lady. This is always, I love that moment, too. I just feel like, again, it was just, it's not a necessary moment for the story. It just reminds us that wherever you are in this world, Anna and Mary, upstairs, downstairs, servant or employer, there's a sense that they're all in it together. They're all part of one world and, in a sense, one bigger family. This was wonderful. We had this sequence and then what continues after it, you know, a couple of nights spent out in the rain with the actors. And I always worry a little bit because they're going to end up being soaking wet and standing around for hours that way. And we just had so much fun. They enjoyed it so much. I'll join you there. So. This is a very tricky scene, I think, because here is where we start to think, wait a minute, maybe this guy isn't exactly who we think he is, but who is he? Whose side is he on? Is he there checking Tom out to protect the king from him, or is he there to lure him into... It's really hard to tell, and I think it's a tricky scene that's important because it doesn't answer anything for us, but it raises the question, so then we start to watch the next couple of things in a slightly different way, the next few things that involve him. Yes. We'll bring a special chair up for the Queen after breakfast when hopefully it will have stopped raining. I shall carry it myself, my lord. What's about the king? Well, he'll be on his horse. But suppose it's still raining. God will make it stop. Is that tough? So again, this is, you know, now Robert doesn't realize any of this other part of the story, but Mary is starting to look at it and think, hang on, maybe he is starting to plot something, or what, what could be happening? Why does, is he having this kind of secret life? The day has dawned and the weather proves conclusively that God is a monarchist. Who could doubt it, Molly? Staging a scene like this is like planning a battle almost. First of all, you have to know exactly where everyone would be placed, which is a very specific thing according to protocol. And Alistair Bruce, the the historian on the film and on the series, laid it out with me. What are the possibilities? Exactly how would people be placed? In what order? How would things happen? You know, who speaks to whom? In what way? When do people bow and curtsy? You know, every bit of that has to be so carefully done. And yet, you have to make the scene progress in the way that it progresses, the lines and the way that they happen. And so sometimes it means moving them around a little bit because you say, well she couldn't speak until that happens, or they couldn't go to her first, they'd have to go to him first, or certain things like that. So all of that, Julian and Alistair and I would work together and say, okay, if this is the layout, then first they'd go to her, then they'd go to him, then they'd pass, so these two people could have a, a secret moment, and things like that. So that's one of those things that's woven very much from the script, exactly as it's written, but on the set, it gets adjusted to the way it would be. And one of the things I appreciate so much about working on Downton is how seriously they take all of that. They don't just say, oh, well, it's a movie. Let's not worry about that. They say, no, let's adjust it so that it is the way it would be done and can still work for the script. Cousin Maud, Violet, are we going to kiss? I'm glad you want to kiss me. It wasn't quite what you And this is where we really see the two of them meet and sort of realize that there's a lot of tension under the surface and, you know, it's going to start buried, but we have a very strong feeling that it's not going to uh, stay that way. Can I help you at all? Tuppence Middleton, beautiful and delightful actress, incredibly gifted, warm, and um, I think does such a great job on this. And it's so interesting, too, because, you know, it's so hard to ever know exactly what makes chemistry, but you could just tell when the two of them were first on set together, the way they were enjoying each other, that it was going to work because they just had such a natural 
playfulness together, appreciation for each other, and, and that really communicated. It's bit, but thank you, Albert. It's a relief. I want the milk now, I want the egg yolks now, I want the olive oil now, and I want the vanilla pod now. Love's a clip round the ear now. Careful, Mr. So this is important here, too. This is where it all starts to build and where we need with this, the two worlds really fully come to a head and they're most humiliated downstairs and where we realize, they realize, okay, this is not going to stand. They're going to have to find a way to acquit themselves. Keep them down here, Mr. Carson. That goes for you, too. Stay out of the... I always find it really interesting. This is David Haig, who plays the royal butler or the, <laughs> the king's page of the back stairs, as he says. But, you know, I always find it so interesting so often that some of the loveliest, warmest, sweetest people in the world often play the best jerks. And um, that's the case with David. I mean, he couldn't be a funnier, smarter, lovelier man. And, uh, you know, he plays this uptight, you know, jerk again, just so well and so convincingly. And you, Lady Grantham, were you affected by the general strength? But my maid was rather curt with me while it was on, sir. But you know, she is a communist at heart, so I suppose it was to be expected. Wasn't the princess joining us? They telephoned Lord Lassell's has been held up by something. Mm. Uh, but they are planning to come for the parade. I imagine the servants' bedrooms are quite pleasant here. Why? Are you worried for your maid? How clever of you. Lucy is more of a companion than a maid. I'd hate for her to be uncomfortable. Of course. I really have to go. You can't embarrass Mama. I'm sorry, but you must wait until we stand. Lord Hexham. How is Northumberland? As beautiful as ever, sir. Can it spare you, do you think? So this is also where now Edith's story starts to kick in about worrying that her husband is going to be kind of sent away on this, you know, royal junket that he would be part of. And normally that would be, that is a great honor and it would be something she would be proud of and expect. But so we, we wonder why is she upset about it? Is she just clingy or, or whatever? But we start to see it later. And here's where the plot starts to develop downstairs. I'm walking to Mr. Bakewell's. If you've any errands. Oh. And you well, then, we should get moving. Oh. Of course, sir. Yes. Yeah. Ma'am. Right. What was the king saying earlier? I couldn't hear. He's planning a tour for the Prince of Wales next March. He'll take in most of the African colonies and finish in Cape Town. And he wants you to go. He thinks I'm a steadying influence. How long would you be away? About three months. I can't believe my luck, can you? <laughs> and here as we get out there, you know, and they're all about to go to this big royal parade. They're all leaving to go one way, and Tom's going this other direction, kind of in a hurry. And now Mary, who's been nervous about it, and first she just dismissed the thought that there was anything going on, but why is he acting so furtively? And she's worried now. You can tell she's genuinely worried, and that's why... As we get here, you know, she's been following him. She, now she's worried that she needs to keep an eye on him. This was shot in a village called Laycock, and it is a National Trust village. The whole exterior of this village is kept intact, and we had it available to us for an entire week while we shot this whole sequence and the other sequences that you'll see that are there. So now we see him, and he's got a gun, and we're not sure who he is and whose side he's on and all that. And it's, we're starting to build the tension as all this is coming together. But this is the actual royal troop, the Queen's royal troop that's been around since that time. The horses, the cannon, the uniforms would all be the same. The only thing that would be different is that now there are both men and women in it, and at the time there would only have been men. This was one of our really biggest sequences, probably, where we had the royal troop, several hundred extras, and it was a pretty complicated day. And again, we had three days in a row of the most beautiful, perfect sunshine. So it all looks beautiful and matches, but we were very, very lucky to get all that going in that way.
So now clearly he's come out and we know that he, something's going on, we don't know what, and then he's come to this place and ends up in the one place he, he didn't think he could get to. He was actually using Tom to try to get to him, we discover. But that's what he's here for, is that he's actually an assassin. And it's based on a true character who was from real society and had that upper crust British background and everything and was a soldier. And he became very politicized about the Irish freedom movement and actually fought for it and was executed for it eventually after an attempt on the king's life. Are you all right, sir? Your ladyship. Why are you even here? I didn't suspect him myself until last night. I was, I don't know, you're giving up on a free island. Isn't it free? So this is where we find out in the scene what exactly it was that he was fighting, that he thought Tom would be on his side and might even understand what he was doing without them speaking about it directly. And Tom understands that, as he tells us here, that he slowly began to understand that there was something going on and that the man was using him to get close to the king. And he was actually trying to protect them without making a scene about it. This is another extraordinary day of shooting. So to have the actual royal troop there in formation performing these kinds of maneuvers that they would do, these beautiful ceremonial parades and review of the troops, it was just an incredible gift to have that. That's actually, that gentleman, Harry, it was actually is the leader of that troop, and he, it's a, a great honor, and we had people from there. It took about, well, it was an entire day of just shooting this one little part of the sequence, but it took a day to just set up, well, it was weeks of setting it up, but they arrived the day before, and there was an enormous camp that I think there might be film of in the um, behind the scenes material that we took of them. We had to set up an entire camp for these horses and soldiers and you know hay and water and a mess tent and everything out in the middle of Yorkshire to be ready for this. And they arrived and set up and you know we worked it through with them and did a quick just sort of talking rehearsal and then the first time they of course they hit it perfectly they hit every mark they you know they're just magnificent they're so highly trained they're such a precise group and again they were proud to be a part of it it's nothing they've ever done before they've never been involved in any kind of film or television project but they were so proud to be part of Downton and I think they knew that Downton would treat it with such respect and generosity that they really were quite generous of their time He's not feeling well. Wasn't he out shooting yesterday? What do you want me to say? Nothing. You have to let me leave him. We will not talk about it now. Is that your... Yeah, so we know something's going on with her and her maid, and, you know, we were trying to track that, and... It's part of Violet's concern about the estate not going to Robert. It's so strange. It seems so English. This is where Tom really explains the story of Chetwood and um, who he was. And, and the story really is based on the story of the original guy. Not at any cost. I'm a law and order man these days. That's what you lot have done to me. <laughs> So will there be a great splash all over the newspapers? Poor Papa. Oh, no. You'll find there isn't a whisper about this anywhere. An establishment cover-up? I don't believe in conspiracy theories. Yes. Uh, Miss Smith, did Mrs. Hughes sort you out? She did. And have you enjoyed the parade? <laughs> <laughs> Do you work at the house? Not exactly. I sell cars and I help with the estate. Lord Grantham is my father-in-law. Oh, I do beg your pardon, sir. Oh, no, please. Let me explain. I started here as a chauffeur. 
You must be Lady Sybil's husband. Uh, yeah, so here again, it's just setting up these two have a natural connection. And, you know, we wanted it to feel for both of them. When the, In the first scene, when he sees her, he doesn't know she's a maid. He's just attracted to her and, the, and that she doesn't know he's part of the family. So that we wanted to be clear that underneath their attraction, there was no sense of him trying to take advantage of a maid or her trying to, you know, work her way into a, a higher position or something. Sometimes I didn't know who I was. But you and also to remind the audience and, and new people to introduce them to the idea of who he is and exactly what, what his story was in the family, that he was married to Sybil and she died. This was the first scene that we shot with all the downstairs actors. And I remember when we first got together, it just seemed everybody was very happy to be there and it was a fun scene to do. But at the very beginning, it seemed very, very stiff. And then I remember at one point, everybody got into the spirit of it together and they started overlapping their lines and laughing together and feeling really like a team. And then after we, I called cut from that rehearsal, everyone let out a big laugh and... Anna here, Joanne Froggett, she said, oh, that's right, we know how to do this, oh, good, good. And it was really like coming back to something, you know, that they had forgotten that they were this very, very well-tuned company, the downstairs, and how they did scenes together. And I think it was very good fortune that we ended up doing the scene first because everyone was in it and everyone rediscovered at the same time how these scenes need to work and how they all have to work together in them. We need to get rid of the royal Especially party. because what's so interesting about these scenes and so difficult is that everybody has such a different point of view. You know, Carson's fighting it, and, you know, some people are skeptical, some people are fully on board. And, um, you know, to keep it moving forward and keep track of everybody's specific points of view is tricky, and I think they, they love the challenge of it. It's like a little chamber piece. I will play no active part in this. Well, suppose His Majesty sees what's going on and is displeased. Why? Do you think I'm not capable of cooking a decent dinner? Oh, no, of course Why? not, but, but... I'll see to the footman. What are you going to do? You'll find out. So does this mean we're back on duty after all? Me and Mr Mosley? And Albert as well. You know where to find the state liveries. <laughs> well, I pour wine for the Queen's sweet lips. Are any more of that and we'll lock you in the attic? I don't know why you're bothering. What about that Mrs. Webb who keeps telling us she's the housekeeper? Don't you worry about Mrs. Webb. I am more than a match for Mrs. Webb. I still don't know how you're going to manage Mr. Corbett. Well... <laughs> I'm just going upstairs to lie down. Can you get things ready for when I come back? When will that be, oh, mighty one? Wake me in half an hour if I'm not already in the kitchen. <laughs> Justice. Tell us about your maid. Well, Lucy is the daughter of David's army servant. James. Again, here we're just, you know, moving the story forward and trying to get a sense of what's important here. And I think there's a little bit of a mislead. We don't, we don't know exactly who Lucy is to her, but we know she's become particularly important to her. I'm glad. You don't sound very glad. So this scene, you know, it's, again, it's another interesting, tricky problem from a plotting standpoint because he can't know who she is, but she knows who he is. And so the things he ends up talking about affect her in a very useful way because he can speak to her in a way that nobody would speak to her because he doesn't know that she's the princess. So he's just being gentlemanly and trying to help a woman who's clearly upset by just befriending her in a gentle way. I suppose you can't be expected to know everyone. Did you enjoy the parade? 
And I think there's a wonderful irony that the audience enjoys that since he isn't a royalist and he is speaking that way to her, she's quite gracious to him about it. She doesn't challenge him about it or tell him who she is because I think in some ways she enjoys being with somebody who doesn't know who she is. It allows her to be herself in a way that she can't normally. People can be decent at the core, but very difficult to live with. True enough. And they're silly too, and snobbish at times. They wouldn't give tuppence for their politics. And I think that's a big theme that runs through Downton, which is, you know, whether you're upstairs or you're downstairs, wherever you fit in the society, so much of your life is circumscribed by the things you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, how you're supposed to behave and not supposed to behave and all of that. And yet... Within it, you know, we're all human beings and we don't all naturally subscribe to those. We don't naturally want to do the things that are expected of us or not want to do the things that are expected of us to avoid. And so it's in a way easier to understand things about people's characters when we know exactly where they're supposed to fit in and then how they struggle against those things or don't struggle against them, live with them quietly or accept them in a gracious way or... Based on where they are, they can treat people well or badly and still be within their rights. So when you see somebody who's royal and who is generous-spirited, it speaks well of them. Very well. But now I must go. That was helpful, thank you. Well, I told you I wanted to help. Thanks to you, we have her cornered. Mr. Wilson, there's a telephone call for you. For me? But, Sir Harry, they wouldn't get to London until nine. It doesn't matter. The ball at Clarence House won't start till ten. What ball at Clarence House? So now the whole plot is kicking in downstairs, and we're not exactly sure what's happening. I love the way he's written it so that the audience is always just one little step behind the characters, that they're all plotting something and we always feel that we have to catch up and figure out, what's wait, what's happening? Who's he on the phone with? Is this part of the plot? And then we realize it was them making the call. Everything all right, Mr. Wilson? And that just continues as we go through this. And the house footman and the hall boy. Uh, when is the next train to London? I hope it's not bad news. Not bad, exactly, but irregular. Very irregular indeed. <laughs> I'll get drummed out of the regiment if they ever find out. Well, you sound convincing to me. Oh, I'm very good at doing Sir Harry Barnston, I can assure you. What if Mr. Wilson rings back? No one queries Sir Harry's orders. But if he did? Well, then they don't cover the trick. But they couldn't trace it back to me. Right, should we go into York? Sorry to miss out on the fun in a way. Where shall I wait for you when you're with you? And here, you know, you just see Thomas befriending this guy and that, you know, there's another person in the world who sort of sees things the way he does and enjoys it the way he does. Did you manage to speak to someone? Which you don't see very often with him. Assistant. They've sent you the wrong one. It's similar in style, but not, as you can see, in size. Well, where's my address now? On its way to New York. Well, that's that then. Wonderful. Everything's going wrong for me today. Milady? Oh, never mind. How are things downstairs? Any better? A bit better, yes, my lady. Again, I'm always so amazed with the way Julian just weaves stories together so you almost don't notice that they're they're moving forward. So on the one hand, the story of her dress and what's going to happen with that, and, you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it's, you know, first it didn't arrive, and then it's way too big, and it's the wrong dress, and she happens to notice something's missing from her room, and there's a story there, but she doesn't even know that that's a story that some things are missing. But now Anna is starting to put it together, and it's just, you know, you don't even realize it, but then eventually these stories are going to intersect. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. How clever of you to find me. Well, not really. I lived here 40 years. I love this scene, too, because, you know, she said before in the previous scene, so, good, we'll speak later and we'll, we'll talk after dinner and all that. And she says, yes, of course. And then she comes up to her bedroom and she says, why are you here? Oh, just to, just to confirm our talk later and all that. And I thought, mm, do we really need that? You know, we know all this is going on. But then the minute I saw Maggie read it, it was so clear that what she's come to do is 
get a glimpse of the maid and hopefully see the two of them together and and figure out something about what their relationship is and why she seems so smitten with her and all of that. So that it really, the whole scene, its purpose is really the subtext of Maggie getting a chance to see the maid because truly she probably would never even have looked at her close up other than the fact that she saw her at the parade because they were always kept so separately. You're not to speak, you're not to think, just follow my lead. Their majesties must not know they're being served by anyone different. Do you hear me? I don't want them to even notice. Charlie, who plays this young footman, Albert, was an extra on the show for many years playing a hall boy. That's actually what he's playing in this. And he came back for the film. He's in drama school now. He's a wonderful young actor. And he was always so good in the background, the way he'd react to things and his ability to, to repeat and his professionalism. So... We gave him a couple of lines, and he's in the film, and it's his first part with lines, and it was exciting. It felt in a funny way similar to the story, which is the hall boy who becomes the footman. It's like the extra who becomes the, the actor. I shall have to go and change. This was a fun scene to shoot. Again, it's always fun when you have all of them because every one of them is acting and giving you something and reacting and looking at each other. So there's always a lot of things to choose from in the editing room. If you don't want me to, I won't. But you've already said that you will. Because it's a fantastic chance. It didn't occur to me you'd mind. I don't, exactly. Not in that way. Then in what way? I wasn't going to tell you. I wasn't going to tell anyone, but... I might be pregnant. So this is where we obviously we find out that she might be pregnant and that changes everything. And now he, of course, doesn't want to leave her around the time the child will be born. But this is one of those things that, again, I think most people don't realize. But, you know, if the, the king asks you to be involved in some important project, you can't say no. That is part of what that whole world is or certainly was at the time. And so he's definitely caught in this bind between the personal, the, the modern idea of family, which is that a husband and wife are around for these things together, and this sort of old, uh, not quite dying out phase that, well, if the husband is asked to do something, you know, by the king, he goes and does it, and she just, you know, will be home alone and take care of things. This whole sequence in some ways, all of this, this story and how it develops in the dining room is a little further and a little bolder comically than Downton had gone as a series sometimes. And I think it really, as a film, earns it because it's a nice kind of juicy story that involves a lot of people and is a little bit heightened. Are you all right? Has something happened? Old Lady Grantham came in while we were dressing. I think the stage is set for a fight later, about me. She thinks Lady Bagshaw means to favor me and she doesn't approve. What business is it of hers? Lady Bagshaw must have her reasons and that's good enough for me. Going down, Tom. Good night. So now here's where a couple of other stories, you know, these, I was saying, start to intersect, which is she's put it together now that Lawson is the person stealing things and based, you know, she had seen her in that room wandering alone and she kind of realized, oh, this is it. And she finds a way now to bring these two stories together, which is to say, okay, I know you did this. I need help solving this problem with my mistress's dress. And she does that. And, you know, in terms of the whole, you know, the plot of the film, Anna is really the center point of a lot because she gets this thing done and sets it up. She's the one who really sets up the plan to take over from the royal servants, and it gives her a nice like active more. role. I can't sew a dress in a night. When would I sleep? When you get to Harwood tomorrow. And don't think I won't tell. Queen's dresser a thief. That'll make headlines from here to Peru. The 
the Marquis and Marchioness of Granby. So again, the reminder of how meaningful it was for Mosley to be part of this, to, you know, after having it snatched away from him earlier. Where are the royal footmen? They might have got back to London. And again, I, I like this sort of thing, this little moment here, because so often, you know, the upstairs and the downstairs are such separate worlds that you forget they, you know, the upstairs often has no idea what's going on downstairs. And so to have a little moment like that where we know what's going on, but they don't. This is shot in an intact bar in Hempstead in London. It's this perfect little bar, and we thought it had exactly the right scale for a bar in New York at the time. I'm going on to Turton's in a minute. Do you know it? This is really interesting and, I, and very exciting for me, I think, to show a story like this that's a period-correct story about a gay man, how he would have live the kinds of interactions he might have had and then as we go into it more really what that world was like in a in a bigger way so it's more than just on the personal level of you know his own hopes disappointments loneliness fears that we've seen before but we now start to actually see it in the context of the bigger world at the time and i think everybody in the production did a very good job of portraying it accurately and sensitively. What about you? Surely you can't really mean to leave His Majesty unattended. What is it for me to attend him? Well, you've got your breeches on. I have, but... Mr. Carson, this is your destiny. You know as much, and so do I. Now, accept it proudly and walk into that room with your head held high. You can do it, Mr. Carson. Yeah, it's important here that now, you know, this idea, we're really laying the groundwork for, say what an important and exciting opportunity it is for them to actually serve the king and queen at dinner. And even for Carson, it's intimidating. Or would you rather ruin the evening? That's telling her. <laughs> Mrs. Patmore forgot to stand up the sauce. Oh, the chop tank. Oh, that's kind when it's not your job. Nonsense. We must all pull our weight tonight for Downton's glory. Now... Are you ready, boys? Ready as we'll ever be. We'll be fine, Mrs Hughes. What about you, Mr Mosley? I know I'm going to forget my lines. You haven't got any lines. You're on. Oh. I love this little moment as they're all getting going together, the nervousness, the excitement, everybody on board supporting each other. I love this little moment between the ladies as they walk out. They're sort of their, their own pride and excitement. And then again, I, I love this whole sequence. I mean, this part of the film where we're going back and forth between the sort of the most royal, ceremonial, expensive, beautiful, lush part of the world, and then this underworld of a kind of, I guess you would call it almost like a pop-up gay bar, because there weren't gay bars then, there couldn't be. And men had to find a way to gather together, and it would have been men of every kind of class and profession, because there really weren't places to go except places people would gather kind of in secret. And so we put this together in a way that it would feel like, obviously not a bar, but like almost like a warehouse where gentlemen like this knew they could gather and would tell each other about it and nobody else would know. I wish I could tell them how grateful they should be to you. You were every bit as brave as I was. Mary, you're talking in the wrong direction. That you're talking in the wrong direction, I, you know, people nowadays find so odd, and it is odd, but, you know, it was really very codified when the Queen was turned to her right, speaking to somebody, 
she would do it for a whole course, and all the women would be speaking to the, the men to their right. And then at the course change, she would turn and speak to the, her person seated to her left, and then all the women would do the same thing. Wherever you were in conversation, that's what you did, and that's how it worked. So nobody was ever left out of a conversation, and it always was shifting back and forth. What simpletons men are. This is good. I thought something else was planned, but it is excellent. So, a well done to old Corbet. <laughs> this wasn't Monsieur Corbet, Your Majesty. Mrs. Patmore cooked it. In fact, it would be absolutely unheard of for a servant to ever speak who wasn't spoken to. And in his enthusiasm, he's lost track of that, and now it's put him on the spot. <laughs> I do beg your pardon, Your Majesty. That's quite enough, Mosley. You must give our compliments to Mrs. Patmore and all the staff. Mosley, huh? Her Majesty is speaking to you. With pleasure, Your Majesty. Whatever this strange thing is that he does, you know, I think it was written in the script, he does something between a bow and a curtsy, and it's so sweet and well-meaning and inappropriate and incorrect, and kind of I think it's such a lovely comic moment. I was excited that they've had to take over from our people. I wonder what's happened. Whatever may have happened does not excuse his behavior. I can assure you, Lady Granton, we are quite used to people behaving strangely when we are near. <laughs> That's John Lund playing the piano, the composer of Downton Abbey, the famous themes and everything. And we thought as long as there were musicians in it, we should have him at some quick point. <laughs> and this is a reminder too, you know, in those days, it wasn't just looked down on, it was illegal and you would, your life could, would be ruined if you were arrested for something like this in a place like this. He, you would lose your job, you'd lose your position, you would never get a recommendation for anything else again. And, um, you know, it's, it would be a real source of shame and a major loss in every way for people like this. And I'm very pleased with the way it came out and how it's depicted emotionally and socially. wound round her little finger. And we need to know why. Mm. Well, I'll look forward to it, gentlemen. Thank you. What is it, Hexham? So, yeah, this is where he can't really ask to be let out of it. He feels too much responsibility and obligation for that. So he's trying to get the king to let him out. He assumes he'll understand, and he tries to set it up, but then he, he doesn't. The, the thing is, sir... It's due to be born around the time the prince and I will be setting off on tour. Excellent. Please make it register with him. Help the prince to understand what it means to have a real family life. You can be such an example to him. I know it. Very well. Let's get to the point. Robert is my nearest relation on my father's side. He is. But he will not be my heir. And there we have it. Who will be, can you tell us? Lucy Smith, my maid. What? Are you out of your mind? No, and I know what I'm doing. On the contrary, you're, you're clearly insane. You should be in an asylum. How like you, a word of resistance and you slash with your... Again, it's always fun doing these scenes like this where actors who are really close and Imelda and Maggie really know and like each other quite well, when they go at it with each other, I think they enjoy it a little more because... They do feel so safe with each other. And actually, this was a day we, we all laughed quite a bit in between things. Every 
fibre of the English way of life. What piffle you talk. Please. Oh. There is no need to argue. I never argue. I explain. Face it, Violet, I'll outlive you anyway, so it need trouble you no further. And now, I must attend Her Majesty. Game set and match to Lady Bagshaw. Not while I'm the umpire. We had a few drinks, and Mr. Barrow thought it'd be fun to play a trick on the quiz, that's all. It was, only it was important for us in this, visually also, to shoot this part of the world, the whole story with Thomas, and, and going into this in a way that was much grittier, darker, rougher than the Downton world. And so, just as it was, the production design was developing and the the way we shot it, we wanted it to feel like a kind of a much darker, grittier underside of the world to, to sort of remind people that this is all happening, you know, at the same time as all this glamorous, elegant, bejeweled world is taking place. This is shot in a town called Bradford in the north, and kind of a depressed town. I think it's gone through some, some tough times, maybe doing well, but, but, you know, there's so much of it that's still so intact, and so we, we knew we could get the scale of it, you know, for a film. Because, you know, in television it would have to be, you'd have to limit more what you could see because the ability to really shut down large areas like this on the schedule and budget we had before, you know, wasn't possible, but here it is. I'm, a, I'm afraid I've been a silly boy. Just needs to be a bit more circumspect in future, Mr. Barrow. Could you please remove it, lady, leaving the pins? Anna Robbins, the costume designer, you know, had an interesting task, and I think she solved it really beautifully, which is how do you take an enormous dress that's, you know, obviously been made for somebody much, much larger than this actress for the story, and then take that same dress and in one night, you know, believably turn it into something that would work on her. And so she designed something that then she could take the elements of it and take them apart and put them back together in a way that would look good on Edith. Only to say that you're a genius. Good night. Good night. Harry was in the middle of his run of... Harry Haddon Payton, who plays Bertie, was in the middle of his run for My Fair Lady in New York on Broadway, and um, we needed him for a few weeks, and so he took his vacation around when we were shooting for him, so it was sort of tricky. We had to work it out, so all his scenes were shot in a very condensed time period together. There was a lot of that because the actors are so far-flung. They're all over the world now, working on different kinds of projects. That so much of the schedule, which would have been dictated by logistical things of the nature of locations and time of the year and all that, but it had to be done more around who was available when because people were coming from everywhere to be a part of it. And, you know, Leslie Nickel, who plays Mrs. Patmore, was going back and forth almost every other week to India where she was shooting a miniseries there. So everybody was there when they were there, but it was pretty unnerving at times trying to make sure people would arrive exactly in time. People would have guessed exactly who takes notice of a servant, I hid her in plain sight. Did you love Jack Smith? Everyone should know a total love at least once. Jack was mine. My husband was very dull, you know. He wasn't a bad man, but he wasn't a clever one either. And then he died and Jack came to see me and it began from there. How daring. I know it sounds reckless, but I was 39 when I got pregnant. I thought I was barren. Of course, I knew I couldn't tell my father. The detail in all these costumes is really amazing. And one of the things about doing it, knowing it was going to be on the big screen and you would really see 
even more detail than you would have normally seen in television because it's blown up and at such high quality that Anna really raised the bar and, and just put even more detail into every costume and more hand beading and jeweling and, and everything. Kept you silent on the subject. Yes, in a way. But it was cowardice, really. Now, by making Lucy my heir, I will have taken the first step. You must tell Violet at once. I couldn't. You're wrong. As soon as she knows the truth, she'll fathom your plans and cease to fight you. The servants seem to be enjoying themselves tonight, especially mostly. You know what's so funny is these two actresses, and there's certain kinds of combinations like this. They have done so many scenes together where they're dressing Mary or she's getting undressed or ready for bed or, you know, changing or finishing her, uh, putting her jewelry on or something, that I don't stage them beforehand, really. I have a sense of the kinds of things they'll be doing and where in the day it is and all that and then really work with them because they're so good at knowing when when they want to be still, when they want to be in the middle of doing something, when they want to be looking each other in the eye, or when Anna can say something from behind Mary over her shoulder. And they stage themselves so naturally because the two of them know the characters so well and know their roles as, you know, servant and mistress so well that they, they fall into it and it becomes kind of like a, a very natural dance between them. I want everything to stop being such a struggle. Will the staff stay? Will the farms pay? What are we going to do about the roof? This is really the theme of the film that she's talking about, which is what does it take to keep a house like this running? And is it worth it? Does it make sense in modern times, you know, in the 20th century? And I think it's still a question worth asking, and I think that Julian is really interested in what makes it worth holding these houses up and... Is it worth keeping them as private houses? And is it fair and is it right? Ah, Miss Smith. Is she settled for the night? She's more rattled than settled. And I was right. There was an argument. And it was about me. I hear from Lord Grantham she's planning to alter your life for the better. He says old Lady Grantham was up in arms. I can imagine. Are you entitled to your good luck? Do you know why she's doing it? I do. And I think it's fair. Go forward in health and use your luck wisely. I have such a feeling that you can understand what's going on inside my head where no one else does or ever could. I'll miss our talks. Would you like to write to me? I could always provide a shoulder. Alan Leach, it's so wonderful in this film that he, he has so many interesting things to do. Sort of the romantic, the heroic, the, you know, he gets to be really involved in all the stories here. And I think the audience really wants him to find love again, real love. And there's a wonderful sense here that this might be it for him and that she's somebody worthy of him and that they're right for each other, that they'll fit together in the world. And now I think it's time to say goodnight, Mr. Branson. Good night, Miss Smith. I think that one of the things they did so beautifully in this scene is, you know, I think it's easy to forget in the modern world how at that time, how meaningful a first kiss is, how rare it is, how special and how emblematic of something much more important it, it was. You're not coming round to her, my you? No, it, it was decent of a daisy when she could let it spoil things. Not everyone's like Robespierre. Let's hear it for the king and queen. The king and queen! I've got to tell you something, Daisy. It's interesting now, you know, as we're heading into the, the end of it, you know, when we move away for the ballroom later, once the king and queen leave, just kind of wrapping up the stories at the house. I love this scene. I love the way it kind of places the two of them together and and you sort of understand something about what it's like, not just for two people like that to work out a relationship, but where they are in the world as it's changing. 
just for the love of me? I just, my feelings took over. That's all I can say. Can you forgive me? Forgive you? Oh, Andy, I'd have done it myself if I'd had the nerve. <laughs> Don't you see what it means? We're alike, you and I. Full of passion for what matters. I thought you were easily satisfied, but I... They're good friends. They've become good friends from, from the show, and her boyfriend and his girlfriend, and they're all, they're all quite close. And, and there's something you read, I think, genuinely in the love between them, as those characters, I think, genuinely comes from their love and respect for each other as friends. And it feels good just to be two blokes having a chat, not trying to fit in for once. Oh, we all have to do what we must to get by. But yeah, feels good to be two ordinary blokes. This was interesting, too, just the idea that they're coming home. It's an angle we've never really seen of the show, but it's actually what the back of the castle looks like, and that, that's sort of the servants' entrance area and, and staff areas. We were shooting, and we were about to shoot the scene that they were going to shoot later, and we just saw Laura walk out toward the set in that sun and with all those midges flying around and all that and said, oh, my God, we just have to get a shot of that. And so we, we did, and now it's in the film. Those are the things you wanted. Why do you do it, Miss Lawton? Doesn't it ever worry you? that on each table in this house there's an ornament that you couldn't buy with a year's wages. And what's your answer? Because everyone can't have them, no one should have them. No. My answer is, why can't I have them? Or some of them. Don't worry, they won't miss what I take. I doubt there's more than one in a hundred will even notice they're gone. But they're not yours, Miss Lawton, and they never will be. I'd give it up if I were you. What if people were to think Her Majesty was light-fingered? If things go missing. This is interesting because there was, you know, in history, there is the sort of gossip of history is that Queen Mary, that Queen Mary, was a bit of a kleptomaniac, <laughs> that she would steal things from houses she went to. And it's a thing that, that Julian does that I think is interesting, which is he takes little pieces of history and then weaves them into the, the Downton story in a funny way and gives them a different angle. So the idea that oh, maybe it was her maid that was stealing those things. The footman have telephoned this morning. It seems it was a hoax that took them up to London. But who would do that? Who indeed? We can investigate when we get to Howard. I should be careful, Monsieur Corbet, unless you enjoy ridicule. What? I'd say the dinner was a success. They sent down their compliments, so I think it must have been. Well, then, why call attention to it? Would you show to advantage in the story, do you think? But what do we say if we're asked? There was a confusion in London. Monsieur Corbet was ill. These things are also interesting, too, because everybody, you know, at the table, all the servants in the house have a secret. They know what's going on. And so keeping track of everybody's taking it in and we know what they know, but the other characters from the royal household don't know it is a fun thing to try to figure out how you're going to show it without overdoing it. Is it something I can help with? Judging by last night, I doubt it. We ended up shooting the scene twice because the first time we did it, it was socked in in fog and all the beauty of the background and that place got lost. And we shot it again. We just said, well, let's see if we get done early. Let's see if we can shoot it later in the day when it's burned off. And then we came back and it couldn't have been more perfect, the light from the background. I also love the way... You know, the lichen on this and the leaves in the background and all of that, you know, work with Edith's costume so beautifully, and it's not an accident. That's the way Anna Robbins thinks. She always knows how something works in its surroundings. Early warning. Their majesties are getting ready to leave. Very good, my lord. What's the matter? Nothing you can help with. Can't I try? Uh, uh, we should go up. Their majesties are on their way. Oh, right. Come on. <laughs> so 
So you're off to London? They'll drop me at the station. Well, I hope we can keep in touch. I feel I've finally found... I think both of these guys, they're both married with several children, and, you know, I, I'm always really touched by how, you know, two guys like that were so proud to be part of telling this story in such a sensitive way, in such an adult, modern, masculine way to tell this kind of story and to be part of it. And I think they're part of a generation of actors that are happy to to be part of that and in some ways to correcting the misunderstandings of history. I hope you enjoy your time at Harvard, sir. Yes, I hope so too. <laughs> It isn't really goodbye when we'll see you all this evening. We're looking for... This, again, what was interesting is in realizing that the goodbyes that are so ceremonial and so ultimately there's not much story in them, but what's interesting about this here is actually what's going on under the surface with the servants. But this is another one where, you know, just the, the ceremonial planning of shooting something like this is actually the most complicated part of it. Carson, what happened to the royal servants last night? Hard to say, my lord. They sort of gave up the ghost. Well, you managed splendidly. Although I could have done without Molesley's aria. But please thank the staff for saving the day. Uh, Mrs. Bates, can I ask you something? What did you give Monsieur Corbet? A double dose of a sleeping draft. We used to joke on the set quite a bit that, that Bates and Anna, you know, they they run this story and they, you know, they drug somebody and knock him out and trap somebody in a room. And really, if you go through their stories in the series, they were always involved in these kind of funny things, usually by accident and usually not their fault. And they had both been accused of murder and everything. And so it was sort of funny that they should be the ones who are responsible for that. You're right, Mrs. Patmore. It's time I started to plan my wedding. Well, I don't know what took you so long. I wasn't sure before, but I am now. Well, that's good to hear. I'm happy, Mrs. Patmore. I don't often say that, but I am. I love being able to shoot scenes like this just with one shot with two actors who really know what they're doing and can be completely alive from beginning to end. And it, it just makes you feel more like you're really there with them. And me part of it to boot. I don't know what came over me. But? <laughs> they had it coming to the Melsey. Let's face it, they had it coming in spades. Matthew Good, you know, was busy shooting another series at the time, but everybody felt it was really important that he be part of it. So the story developed in this way where he was gone and he makes it back just in time for the, the final sequence of the big ball at Harwood. And so he can understand that he and Mary are happy together still. And... Their future is solid. I should think she'd be lying down, sir. They all will be. Sounds ominous. <laughs> That's nice. That he's back in time for the ball. And thank the Lord we don't have to organize it. I love this shot of him going up the stairs, sort of showing his excitement to be back and see her. And then that last little thing where he pulls his jacket and wants to look good for her. Oh, darling, you don't know what we've lived through. I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner. It was the first ship after the last meeting, I promise. No, oh, never mind. You're here now. And I don't have to go to the ball alone like a sad little wallflower. Well, I'll only come if you promise to dance with me non-stop. Oh, it's a deal. So then here we go to Harvard, and this is... You know, the other of our really, really big cinematic sequences and to have all these people in this extraordinary place and then to have the time to really shoot it properly was a real gift. 
If you continue in this vein, you will only make yourself look stupid. What, what do you mean? What I said. Here, it's amazing that, you know, every... Every actor has a you know an original costume for, for for many scenes, but in this one, everyone has a very specific costume that was made just for this scene. So, just I mean, if you had seen the the tailoring shop and the seamstresses and the beaders and the jewelry makers and everybody working on this, it was unbelievably impressive the scale of it and the detail of what people achieved on every one of these costumes. It's just amazing. I can make it work. Branson, the Irish Republican. Ooh, you're well informed. I'm better informed than you know. So he persuaded you to do this. And we were talking after the parade. And there he is. Say something nice. Please. Oh, uh, wait, thank you. Mr. Branson. Again, this is all actually shot at Harwood, which is still looks like this and is still quite extraordinary. Except for the ballroom scenes, which we're moving into soon, that were shot at Wentworth House. But that beading on Mary's dress, in the scenes where you can really see it close up, and right now the detail of it is absolutely extraordinary. Who is she? That's Princess Mary. She was at Downton for the parade yesterday. Didn't you see her? Not at the parade, but I saw her afterwards. At the tea. That gentleman, Alistair King, uh, who plays the conductor in this, is also the conductor and the musical arranger for all the Downton score. So we wanted him to be in this conducting it. Plus, it just made it easier because he really knew what it would be like. It seemed too great a leap for you. Well, who do you think I am? Some maiden aunt who's never left the village? Obviously not. Well, don't think I approve, because I don't. Or at least I understand. Does Miss Smith know the truth? Yes, she does. When I get home, I will hire another maiden. Lucy can be my companion. But that's much more suitable. And I'm afraid you'll dislike it, but she says that she and Tom Branson have agreed to correspond. <laughs> dislike it, I will lick the stones myself. <laughs> You are amazing, Violet. You haven't won, you know. I don't believe in defeat. It's interesting, you know, in, in this sequence now, we sort of have to close up all the stories and all the relationships, and each couple, you know, that we recognize, we need to kind of understand where their story ends for the film, and this is the one between the two of them, because really they are one of the great couples in the show, as, as much as Cora and Robert or... Henry and Mary, they are a couple. They are two important people and one of the most important relationships in the show. After all these years, you still astonish me. Oh, good. I'm glad I'm a revelation and not a disappointment. <laughs> it's very important. Right. Ah, yes. There you are, Hexham. I'm sad you can't be part of the Prince's tour, but we'll find something else for you to do. What? Sir, I, I didn't... Um, I understood why not, uh, as soon as Her Majesty had explained it to me. Congratulations to you both. <sighs> You're looking very sunny tonight. I'm happy. Why? Does it bother you? No. But tell me, what are you playing out with Tom and Cousin Maud's famous maid? What do you mean? I heard you at dinner last night. What are you up to? You know she'll inherit the Brumpton estate. Well, so Mama told me. Well, then, wouldn't you like Tom to have a proper establishment? Oh, you devious cat. <laughs> will they be happy? Do you think they will? This story now, you know, she sets up early on that she was in London and wouldn't tell anybody why she was there. Violet, Maggie's character, and so... You know, by the time we get to this scene here, and, and this is obviously probably the most, it's the most emotional scene for them and also for the audience in the film. And it was very difficult scene to shoot, not in any technical way at all, but because it's such a long scene and it's such an emotional scene. And the two of them, I think, really 
have a relationship that's very much like yes. like and Violet and Lady Mary's relationship. And Maggie and Michelle really adore each other. And I think in some ways, as she was telling her this story that she's passing on the legacy of Downton to her, I think in a way it was really Maggie also and Michelle sort of saying she's the next generation of actresses and they've worked together and they love each other and they've been meaningful. But now, you know, Maggie's closer to the end than she is to the beginning. And Michelle is really just taking off. And I think it was a very meaningful and emotional scene for them for that reason, too. I love him dearly. No, I, I mean you. You are the future of Downton. But I have such doubts, Granny. Are we right to keep it all going? When the world it was built for is fading with every day that passes, will George and Caroline still be living that life? Are we living it now? No, our ancestors lived different lives from us, and our descendants will live differently again, but Downton Abbey will be part of them. I wanted to shoot this also in as simple a way as possible so that the actors wouldn't have to worry about the camera at all. They could play the whole scene from beginning to end, every angle, every time, and we didn't have to worry about resetting the camera or just setting it up for a few lines or doing parts of it. We kept it very, very simple and in, on lenses that were very far away from them so they could create an intimacy without being distracted, and I think it really is achieved. But should you be here tonight? Won't you be worn out? Oh, Mary, I can't spend the rest of my life in a shower of how are you feeling and are you quite well? No, no. The point is, I'll be fine until I'm not. That's all there is to it. Ah, oh, there you are. The dancing's starting. Huh? You mustn't miss it. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you'll always be with us, Granny. Staring from every picture, talking from every book, as long as the house stands. Sounds very exhausting. <laughs> Do you know, I think I should prefer to rest in peace. <laughs> Again, you know, he uses this opportunity to just close up all the couples and let us know where everybody's going to be now heading into the future. And, you know, as a result of this chapter that this movie covers, something I think that's interesting, this film, because it was a marble floor, we wanted it to feel like it was a wooden floor in the center of it, at least. It would have been a sprung wooden floor if it was a ballroom. So that pattern you see that's in the middle on those high shots, all the brown wood, that was all done and put in in linoleum, you see it there. And, uh, but the exact pattern of what was on the floor underneath, it was created in a wood finish. And this was something, the two of them had had to end here, and then Liz Truebridge had the idea that we, we should absolutely find a spot, maybe we could find a place to put it in where the two of them would have snuck off to dance together or where he might have found her because they could never dance in this. He could never invite a maid to dance with him. Even for her to be in that ballroom is a bit of a, a misstep for her. So we shot those shots at the end of, of him going to find her and them dancing and then, and then realized that it became a, such an important part of how we were gonna tell the ending of the story. It was important that it feel like everybody was 
again, it's not the very end because the lives will go on, but that we get a sense of where everybody is. I've got a question for you. Hmm? You'd never want to leave Downton and start up somewhere else, would you? And tell me truthfully. What brought this on? Just tell me. Leave Downton? I think we're stuck with it, aren't we? Yes. Yes, I believe we are. So the actor spent a, a few days working with the choreographer who, just to get everybody comfortable with the same dance and working on it. And, and this, we just kind of stole those shots outside at a good time of Alan and Tuppence dancing together. And, and they turned out to be such a beautiful part of the end of the whole thing, feeling like everybody was somehow involved in the same event. And we also knew that no matter what, However the story ended, it was very important that we end it at Downton somehow. And so this little coda piece that comes here and really sort of says goodbye to it and again reiterates the theme, will Downton be here, should it be here, all that. And at the very end he says, you know, and the Crawleys will still be here. A hundred years from now, Downton will still be standing and the Crawleys will still be here. And that was the last line in the script. Is a promise. We'll see, Charlie. We'll see. And the we'll see, Charlie, we'll see. Julian added when he saw the cut of it, he said, I don't want it to seem so as though the film is saying that this will definitely last and it should, that, that Carson speaks an objective truth, that he wanted to undercut it with a sense of doubt or a questioning. Is it, will it be, should it be? We don't really know. <laughs> 